All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. And thank you very much for liking the video that I had posted yesterday. I decided yesterday to continue to work and post this because some of the cool beans had been asking for it and uh, asking for it in a good way. And I think one of the intent I had was that maybe it can help some of the students or other doctors who are also thinking of uh, um, broadcasting their messages. And one thing that I missed in uh, mentioning that was that the webcam that is over here. So if I can quickly just take this one off. I showed that in there, but I missed mentioning it that my early videos were with this webcam. So it is not necessary that one has to have a DSLR. Majority of my videos were with the web webcam. And then later on, uh, I had attached the DSLR over here. So with this, I hope now you know <laughs> the camera is right in front of me. Below the camera is a TV in which I can see what I'm doing. Then on this side is my uh, tablet and the pen that is here. In front of me here is the mic with the pop filter and on this side is the computer and somebody had asked this question that where where is the users messages where are the people's messages like cool beans messages so they are appearing on this stream yard here in the in the browser so hopefully that was a fun little um distraction <laughs> from the COVID discussions okay so let, now let's start so while you get your questions ready, I'm going to give you a quick um, rundown of the important uh, news. And I'm sure that you are actually more aware of those than me. But still, uh, 6172 is now the dominant uh, strain variant in the UK. I think more than 50% of the overall UK new infections are 6172. This is the variant that originated or was discovered first in India. The uh, Some parts of UK, for example, the west part of the UK has 70% of the new cases that are by this uh, variant. WHO has said that this is a variant of concern as well. And what is the reason for this? The reason is that it is more transmissible. So it is actually 30% to 50% more transmissible than the um, six one uh, sorry 117, B117, which is a UK's original variant to the variant found in UK, Kent. So it is 30 to 50% more transmissible. So of course, it's going to prevail more than that one. And compared to the original Wuhan or wild type virus, it is double in terms of the spread or, or the uh, speed of spread. Now, does that really make it bad? We'll talk about that if you wanted today with drawings. Uh, of course, the bad part is that it is going to hit a larger population within a short period, period of time. The other interesting thing is that the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is prevalent vaccine in India and then in many of the other countries as well, AstraZeneca vaccine after single dose is 30% efficacious against 6172. And after two doses, it is about 60% efficacious. So still holding efficacy, but lower efficacy. And the question now, once again, to be answered, is that the lower efficacy because somehow the virus has escaped? Or is it something to do with the, uh, with the speed of transmission? So I think it is both. Then Pfizer is a little bit better than AstraZeneca in this one. Pfizer single dose efficacy is about um, 50%. And two dose efficacy uh, is about 88%. So Pfizer is still holding on while the um, AstraZeneca is slightly uh, reduced. In, in the same way, the question would continue to be asked that, Will this become more dangerous? Has it escaped? So I don't think that it has escaped, number one. Number two, this discussion would continue to happen that a virus or a pathogen that spreads more is usually less lethal. Or if I flip this statement and I say a virus or a pathogen that is less lethal can spread more. 
because it would not kill the people immediately and it would just keep going to from one person to the other because they are unknowingly or with milder symptoms moving around in the society and giving it to others. Now, if faster transmission or faster infectivity, so I had drawn this once before as well. I'm going to draw this. So let me share my screen for a second. So Bam Bambi Secret has put a comment here, which makes sense. So Bambi is from UK. And Bambi said, <clears throat> Dr. Bean Medical Lectures, Jenny Harris from PHE said, AstraZeneca was used mainly in old people and believes that it is why it looks less effective than Pfizer. And it is possible. Uh, I haven't looked at the cohorts. So Bambi, thank you very much for the comment. OK, so um, look, a virus that is more infective, that means it is readily able to enter a cell, can cause less efficacy out of vaccinated or originally infected people, and not because it has escaped, but because, so let's say this is the virus, here is the virus, that virus has arrived, and it is it has a higher affinity to very quickly bind with the ACE2 and enter the cell. What would happen is it would very quickly start entering the cell, replicating there, come out and get into the other cell fast as well. How fast? With double the speed. That means while the immune system is waking up, and let's say this immune system was built either because there was an original infection, natural infection, or because the person was vaccinated. In both cases, what would happen is that immune system can take 24 to 48 hours for the adaptive arm to wake up. During that time, it's only the innate arm that has to respond. So innate arm would start responding right away. That is why we develop mild cuffs and symptoms. But meanwhile, while this, this guard, the adaptive arm, the memory cells, while they're still sleeping and they're going to wake up in 24 to 48 hours, virus would have caused double the destruction. And Remember that it's not going to be double in terms, just double. It's going to be exponentially more because instead of going from one cell to another one cell to another one cell, it's going to go from one to two, then from two to four, and then four to eight. So that's how it's going to go up exponentially. The result is that by the time immune system wakes up and says, all right, I need to take care of this virus. Meanwhile, virus may have caused more symptoms. Now, if it is so fast, in its process that it kills the person. And that window of time in which the symptoms are not present yet has shortened, then the person would not move around that much, will become sick very fast as well, and the, and the transmission will actually reduce. So I still maintain my uh, learning that a virus that is faster in infecting is slower in causing death. And so uh, I think that is what we will continue to observe. So here, um, future of the virus. This is also another important thing that what is eventually going to happen. And one of the theories that is interesting for me is that, remember, with the children, we had said that children actually have better management of this virus. They can handle it better because, number one, they have more natural killer cells. And number two, they have better cross immunity or trained immunity. What does that mean? Cross immunity means that if I am infected with, let's say, human coronavirus, then I may, may be able to handle SARS-CoV-2 with better strength or better um, immune system response. That is the cross training, the cross immunity. And training is that if I have repeated respiratory infections, then my respiratory system, immune system here, is trained to continue to work against respiratory viruses and is more able to handle SARS-CoV-2 as well. Now, imagine the same children who are getting SARS-CoV-2 today. They become, when they become adults, what would happen is that these children <laughs> I want to give good eyes to child. So these children will 
have better trained immunity, they would actually be able to handle SARS-CoV-2 better. So for future generations, ideally SARS-CoV-2 will continue to become milder and milder and milder. So it is not that it's going to become more dangerous. So I think uh, these are the important things that I wanted to quickly share. There is one more thing which kind of uh, made me a little sad, but it is a tweet. So I do not know how accurate it is. So here, Alvaro Olvaria tweeted, Tamil Nadu is one of the states that dropped ivermectin. So we know that Tamil Nadu at this time is the primary contributor or main uh, main source or hotspot of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID. I think there are more than 12% of the all the cases in India are in Tamil Nadu and increasing. So Tamil Nadu is one of the states that dropped ivermectin. The, I think the person who made that decision, Dr. Priya Samp Sampath Kumar, I do not know. So this is a tweet. I do not know if it was her or not. But somebody said, I'm very proud that we have dropped this. So it is it is attributed to Dr. Priya. And then uh, there is there are graphs can actually all see. And the graphs are showing that um, if you see here, this is India and then This is um, COVID-19 fatalities in Goa. And here, if you see, these are COVID-19 fatalities in Tamil Nadu. And Tamil Nadu is not dropping. It's not going downwards while Goa and other India, the rest of the India is actually going downwards. So we'll look into that a little more. So let's do that part. And again, this is a tweet that I'm showing. This is Tamil Nadu. Let's actually go here. This is Goa. So please see here for Goa, somewhere about here, 11th May is when they decided. Remember, after 8th or 9th May, they decided that hey, we're going to give uh, um, ivermectin to everyone. And they have a decline. And the rest of the India also has a decline in the cases. So I believe that could be attributed to the more general usage of ivermectin because AIMS allowed it. And so this became more aware and people became doctors became less uh, against it. Or this could be a faster deceleration compared to the rest. And the rest may have other reasons as well. For example, human behavior. The question is, how is Tamil Nadu doing in this one? So if I go here. And here is Tamil Nadu. If you see here. Tamil Nadu's active cases continue to go up. They are not going down. So that is Tamil Nadu. Maharashtra was a big contributor in the beginning. I believe that afterwards, Maharashtra also started using ivermectin. So if you see here, their active cases are gone down. Then Uttar Pradesh, remember, Uttar Pradesh at one point was primarily the one that was using um, ivermectin. And so if you see, their cases are very low as well. So from a uh, empirical point of view, from an observation point of view, without actually putting data under this, it does look like the general usage or more broader usage of ivermectin is helpful. So with this, let's now just quickly look at the countries and start answering some of your questions. So India, 26 million cases now, about to be 27 total cases are going up which are cumulative here if you look at it this is the good part that the total cases so remember at one point about 400,000 cases per day and here uh, still a lot but 255 100,000 uh, consider this that this is a country of 1.3 1.4 billion people so for them to be able to quickly contain it is also a good good thing active cases 2.7 million and then a uh, number of deaths are still following. One of the uh, articles that I was reading about India, the deaths that are not showing a similar um, uh, pattern downwards, there are two reasons. One reason is that usually the deaths would 
trail by a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks later, we will see the result of re reducing cases in terms of reduced number of deaths. Secondly, there were some states that are actually sending in their death data later. So because of the delay in reporting, these numbers are not one-to-one um, -one match to the two weeks ago's uh, cases. So that is India. I want to say quickly, <clears throat> Pakistan, neighboring country. And so about a million cases now. And if you see here, the cases just continue to fluctuate. So they're having one more wave, um, 62,000. And the deaths are reduced as well. So daily deaths are about 174. So consider this as well, that Pakistan is about two third of the population of the US. So US is about 330 million population. Pakistan is 220 million. So considering that part, Look at this. US has now about what 36 million cases. Pakistan has less than a million, and so on. So, is this uh, something to look at? Possibly. Uh, now, let's look at UK. UK 4.4 million cases, 170,000 deaths. And check this out. It is still uh, with all those variants of concern, 617, increased transmiss transmissibility, etc., opening up of the society, uh, less care, um, possibly. So Bambi had actually sent me a note about how it looks inside the pubs and how much um, less control in there is. And, and that makes sense once the people have uh, started being together. So here, if you see, there is not a lot of difference here. If I go for a seven-day uh, rolling average, 2,155 to 2,500. So slight uptick, um, but not huge. So the variant is possibly not doing a bigger damage to a community that is careful plus vaccinated. There is another um, news, and this is not to ding on anti-vaxxers. Those folks who are not vaccinated are the ones who are now primarily getting the infection and are in the hospitals. So the the majority of the hospitalized patients are those who did not get the vaccine. Number of deaths, once again, look at this. If I almost no deaths reported. Six on average. That is, if I create a seven-day average, then I can pull the number of deaths there. Otherwise, 17 deaths on May 14, today is May 24, and I don't see, at least in this graph, I do not see any more deaths reported. So that is very, very good. Uh, just as an honorary mention, let's look at US as well. I know this is a non-US discussion, but if you see here for US, US numbers are going down as well. Over this weekend, uh, we went out. We usually just stay in the car and, and drive around. And this, the traffic was crazy. It was as crazy as it used to be before the pandemic. People were uh, out and about. They were traveling. They had bicycles on their, on their cars. They had tents or the other uh, gear, vacation gear on their car. So it seemed as if the society had opened up again. And considering that the number of cases look 13,000, 20,000, if I do a seven day rolling average, 25,000, consider the comparison of the US 254,000 in one day, 254,000 in one day, down to 25,000 in one day. So 10 times reduction. And so <clears throat> number of deaths are following that pattern as well. I'm also very much interested in Israel because folks continue to say, or they continue to wait, some of the um, folks, unfortunately, that because Israel has a dominant uh, vaccinated state, they want to see that somehow the viruses or variants are going to uh, break through. So I don't think that is going to happen. And if you see here, once again, um, 110 cases on April 28th. So I don't know if they actually don't have any more cases or they have just stopped reporting them because they are too less. But the last report was that they had 
April 27th was 106 cases, and that's it. Active cases at this time are 510. When did they have the 510 before? They had 510 or between 400 to 600 on March 19 and 18. March 18 and 19 of last year, where it was just starting, that is the level they have. And then the number of deaths because of this still continuing, but at a lower level. So this is Israel. Now I'm going <laughs> to, sorry, I just did a quick monologue. So let's look at your questions. Um, Art Patron Forever says, is there a correlation for emerging more contagious variants with mass vaccine distribution, possibly of vaccine influence favoring natural selection pressure for vax breakthrough variants? And that's the important thing because this is the seed of thought that Geert had uh, installed in people. And so everybody keeps saying, even this morning, somebody uh, had sent me a an article where a person was going on about the vaccination in India. And they were saying this 617 and this rampant um, infection is because of the vaccination. So if you see here, if I go to Bloomberg, Art Peter and I have uh, talked about this a few times, and you have been a cool bean mostly uh, here. Um, if you see in India, for example, the one dose is 11% and two doses are 3%. So it's not even significant in terms of vaccination. Similarly, if you see, let's say UK, two doses, 56. I think this number is incorrect. Now UK, two doses is about 70%. And one dose is about 40% or more. So if you look at those countries that have had vaccination, US, 49%, 39%. I think it is, once again, more than this. And whenever we are looking at those people who have become herd immunity, that will be already infected plus vaccinated, plus asymptomatically infected and recovered, which we do not really have a good idea of knowing how many. So going back to your question, is there a correlation for emerging more contagious variants? There is no correlation other than there are variants. So UK's variant, many people tried to connect it that it emerged when the vaccination started in UK. But the variant was there before. Then the vaccination happened. If there was a selection pressure issue, then this is the time that UK should generate with 70% one dose, which is less efficacious than two doses, that UK should become a hotspot for generating variants and every day there should be variants and people should be dying. Remember Kahil in January said in two months we would start seeing people dying? That didn't happen. Similarly, Geert had also predicted that now in a mass level, people are going to start having escaped variants. That didn't happen. This India, the variant that originated in India, think about it. We have so many variants of this uh, virus. Very few are actually able to dominate. Most of them are just whatever. So uh, our patron, we can do some more digging into the data, but this is what I have seen so far that vaccination is not so much to be able to say it is vaccinated society that created variants. If we wanted to see that, I think the first society that should create variants will be Israel's society because they have a lot of vaccination, then uh, UK's society, then possibly U US as well. These are the ones that should create variants, not other way around. As for Sai says, Indian Indian states stop using ivermectin. Reason, uh, this is the WHO. When WHO, so for example, this tweet that I mentioned, if Dr. Priya really said that, and if somebody goes to her and says, hey, you know what? All those rest of the states are doing better. Why are you doing this and still proud of it? She would say because WHO says it doesn't work. So the organizations like WHO or CDC or FDA, has given a strong footing to those who are at this time not making the best decisions.
Rajesh says, world is one country for SARS-CoV-2. Absolutely. <clears throat> GB says, one of my friends is ridiculously started taking uh, Fivipiravir on day 12 with CRP-97 and having no steroids. Sir, what will be the what will be your advice? Uh, oxygen saturation is 98% on resting state. We'll get D-dimer tomorrow. If oxygen is fine, then the person is actually on day 12, is actually on recovery side. So, but without knowing the whole uh, body and the labs, I can't predict more, but oxygen saturation seems fine. Rizobit says, did you do a discussion about people on ivermectin prophylaxis building antibodies after COVID exposure? I have not. And I have not seen any uh, link or the data for that. I It's an interesting topic, though. And the topic is, just to reflect back what you're saying, is that let's say if I am on ivermectin prophylaxis and I do end up getting the infection, will I get a milder infection? And then as a result, I would have the antibodies produced. MD says, what are your thoughts on mixing vaccines, especially J&J &J with Pfizer, as there are currently no studies with J&J? &J? So we know that we have studies with the AstraZeneca and Pfizer, and the uh, side effects were observed to be more after mixing them, but immunity or the protection did develop. So if I just give you a mechanism point of view instead of a data point of view, then uh, if Somebody takes, for example, Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson is going to show um, spike proteins, which will prime our immune system against the spike protein. And then if you give Pfizer, which is also going to produce spike protein, then the, they would be a good response as well. The problem that I have been saying for about a year for mixing, not a year, less than a year, for mixing is the dose what was what should be the first dose? What should be the second dose? What should be the gap between them? What kind of adjuvants were present? What kind of uh, people's liking of the vaccine? But for example, UK did right in many of the European countries that for women under 50 years of age, they're saying, hey, if you had taken AstraZeneca, then try to take Pfizer as a second dose instead of risking yourself. I'm proud that I was the one who started this uh, noise at, at the expense of my own skin that at that time I was bashed a lot. But now the world has automatically reached there. Not that my noise is what they heard, but at least I was one of the first ones to say we can address this. So here, um, I think mixing would not be an issue. It is the doses, adjuvants, and so on. And here, for example, in case of AstraZeneca and, and uh, uh, Pfizer, mixing is to help with the side effects. So the house says, I think we should turn to what is the harm of taking ivermectin. So the harm of taking ivermectin, a couple of things. One, we do not actually know that if ivermectin is taken on daily basis or weekly basis or bi-weekly or monthly for a longer period of time, what would happen? We do not know that. So far from the folks who have been having it, it does not look like there is an issue. I have been having it myself. The second uh, part of the discussion is going to be what should be the right dose if it is taken continuously. So that is what is the basic thinking to do in terms of the side effects that I've seen. The side effects are mostly people getting headaches or becoming dizzy or getting GIT disturbances. Mehdi Hassan says, the Sputnik 4, or Sputnik, I think I pronounced it incorrectly, Sputnik 5 has not been approved by WHO. Does that mean the vaccine is not safe? I don't know. So it's a matter of trust as well, right? Do you trust WHO now? Um, so I don't know why they have not approved it. I have to look it up. At least in the Russia's own point of view, they say this is adenovirus type 1 and then type 2. Uh, that they have used in this uh, 
vaccine. So from a mechanism point of view, it is an adenovirus based vaccine. That means it is similar to uh, Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca. But is it as efficacious or not? We don't know. I had done a discussion about it. I reported on the efficacy reported by the company themselves, but not from the independent board and from the trial results. So can't say. Lord Chosen says, hi, Dr. Bean, what is the possibility of ADE or clots with an in inactive virus vaccine versus a viral vector, one like AstraZeneca, which technology is better according to you? So very good question and two questions here. So first one, let's go one by one. First one, what is the possibility of ADE? So that is one, clots is second. So ADE so far has never been observed in humans with any of the other vaccines. ADE is a theoretical concept that was observed in vitro with special circumstances produced for the cells to do ADE. So they were given special uh, situation. ADE has been observed in some lower animals as well. So let's say I'm just going to make chicken, but that doesn't mean it was observed in chicken in some lower animals. <laughs> this is a chicken. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll make it a good chicken here. So it was observed in some lower animals. It was not observed in non-human primates, and it is not observed in humans. Still, uh, Lord Chosen, I have done a talk about mechanisms of ADE. There are five possible mechanisms that can cause ADE. And I have discussed them with the kind of viruses we observed the ADE with and with the kind of uh, uh, experiments in which they observed it. The point of the experiments is that they say, hey, it is possible. Now, the point of observing the humans is to see, is it happening in there or not? So number one, it is so far not seen. There are suspicions, for example, even nowadays, whenever somebody gets um, an infection after the vaccine or after the original infection, people start saying, hey, this was ADE. So it's not necessary it is ADE, but there are suspicions like that. Then the second part of your question, clots with the inactive virus. The clots don't seem to be from the virus itself. However, meaning other vaccines clots, they seem to be from adenovirus. However, we know that the SARS-CoV-2 itself can cause clotting as well. So does this SARS-CoV-2 has a propensity to cause clotting is still to be seen. Good news is that it is given intramuscular. So very, very tiny amount of this would end up in any blood vessel, if at all. And because of that, the clotting will not be as pronounced. But if the antibody system, just like with the Pfizer, or sorry, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, if the antibodies produced here became mad and they caused clotting, then that is possible. So far with SARS-CoV-2, this is not seen. SARS-CoV-2 related clotting is when it causes blood vessel damage directly. And the mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 clotting is not that of the adenovirus clotting. So to then complete the thought, it does not look like with the inactivated virus, there is a concept of ADE or there is a possibility of clotting. That's at least from a mechanism point of view. And I saw a few uh, super chats. So let me go see what they are. And if, uh, if they've already melted away, then my apologies. Alex, David Duke, so thank you for the super chat. Are you okay with giving the EUA, mRNA or DNA vaccines to children under 18 including six months old infants, children are at almost no risk from COVID. So I don't know if this question is uh, uh, more of a curiosity question or a question, a rhetorical question. So I have had this discussion many times that I'm very sensitive about children because I have had young people's deaths in my own family as well. So I'm, I'm a little uh, conservative about children. Having said that, I believe that the vaccines are usually given to children, so vaccines are safe. And then thirdly, the trial has to be done and then done, uh, then administered the vaccine. Now, the question which is fair, and that is messenger RNA vaccines are a new type. They're not fully tested. So I would actually 
prefer us adults to be the um, the observation spots before children are given these vaccines. Um, Rajesh says, sent ciprohiptadine and fluvoxamine protocol for an ICU patient, young male, 35 years to Fortis Hospital. They flatly refused to administer. Yeah, so that is the sad part. Uh, I had said this, and somebody re repeated my message on Twitter. There are two types of victims at this time, victims of COVID and victims of doctors. So Art Patron says, Seashell was making news last week. Is there more news about issues in Seashell breakthrough cases? So Seashell doesn't have breakthrough cases. So this is once again a, a rumor. I actually then did a lot of digging, and I discussed it as well. Seashell had vaccinated about 70% of its population when they opened up their society. And it was the travelers and the non-vaccinated folks amongst which the cases were found which uh, when I had this discussion, I also discussed this, that it is actually not possible to say that people who are vaccinated will not have uh, the infection. For example, if we look at uh, Pfizer, Pfizer, I'm going to use rounded numbers from their uh, trial. So Pfizer said that placebo, out of 20,000, there were 162 cases and vaccinated out of 20,000, and again, rounded numbers. These were 18,900 something, 20,008 cases. So you take the percentages of these, and that is the difference. So I think that what it comes to be is one person getting infected out of 1.130 people, and here one person getting infected out of 2,500 people. That is the kind of percentage difference that is there. That is the 95% efficacy. So that means that one person can still get infected. I saw my, my class fellow's mother passing away after getting COVID, after she was she had two doses of a vaccine as well. So there are such cases too. But uh, the breakthrough cases means that the society, which is, so let's say this is a society that is um, all vaccinated and now they have developed a breakthrough case that means that breakthrough case has broken through that vaccine and now it's going to go through the whole society then it's not going to forgive anyone it's going to go through everyone so are we seeing that no we're not seeing that good questions are patent um Nergi says in the shocking interview, the world's leading virologist stated bluntly, there's no hope and no possible treatment for those who have already been vaccinated. They'll all die from antibody-dependent enhancements. <laughs> so I do not know which kind of world-leading uh, virologist are there. So there, there was a virologist, not a virologist, uh, Kahil. I, I don't like to call her a professor. Kahil said in December, January, that we will all become a uh, modified organism. This is her uh, word set that I'm using. We will all become modified organisms and we will have spike proteins on our cells. And then the we would just all, the people who are getting vaccinated within two to three months, she said, you would start seeing people dying in mass. So here we are after two, three months of vaccination, actually beyond two, three months, what is the sixth month now? vaccinated started in December, and you're not seeing mass casualties of people who are vaccinated. So I don't know where these uh, folks pop up from and start doing these things. Uh, Naveen says, taking cues from Dr. Fareed Jalali, is it correct to assume that patients who are on SSRI because of depression and anxiety are at some sort of protection, does clonazepam has similar action? So as long as something that is being used which would reduce the serotonin or histamine, these are somewhat protective. Now, remember, when we take medicines, our point is not to suppress some chemical substance or some function in our body, but if it is overly active, we try to bring it back towards normal. 
So that means catching the infection, having the infection is still going to be possible. But if the immune system becomes runaway, then such drugs, if they're being taken, they may control the immune system from running away. Now for the clonazepam, it's really just look at the uh, mechanism of action. If its mechanism of action is to reduce serotonin and histamine production, then you should be good. MD says, thanks for your answer on mix J and J Pfizer. Practical or no to boost or wait for more data or a second J and J concerned with waning immunity four months post shot. So <clears throat> this is a very good question and not a great way to answer this because the data is not present. So I can only answer it from a mechanism point of view, which may or may not be supported by the data. So the mechanism's point of view is this, that if you have trained your immune system, you have given that a booster, and that immune system is now became trained, then what happens is at some point, immune system is still going to continue to have the capability to respond. What we have seen is, let's say, three months later, the memory cells start going to sleep. So how do I make it go to sleep like this and these? So memory cells start going to sleep. Active cells have stopped working. And, and we actually have a lower titer of the antibodies. This is something that was in the beginning, a big issue that, hey, antibodies declined. This really are not declining. The immune system is just now relaxing. So here, if you don't take a second dose, Will this immune system lose this capability? That is not known. In my opinion, from the mechanisms of immunology that I've studied uh, in my medicine and in nowadays, they would stay there for two to three years. And because they would stay there, that means it, a dose that is delayed may still be able to wake them up and cause the boosting of it. Remember, many vaccines boosters are actually yearly or even after. However, there is no data for me to kind of say that here is the data to look at. Thank you very much for the super chat, Alex. Dr. Bean, you for not promoting, thanks Dr. Bean, to you for not promoting the use of an experimental vaccine on children and your support of Amectin and no happy talk to vaccinate kids. <laughs> so uh, I am pro vaccine, I've said it many times. And I believe we should protect our children too. I'm a little more sensitive towards children with the newer vaccines. This is a departure from my general strong stance about vaccines. And I have my own vaccine as well. Um, Elizabeth says, question, any thoughts on the Gavi study showing 50% vaccinated still spread virus? Title mounting evidence suggests COVID vaccine do reduce transmission. How does this work? COVID vaccine, evidence suggests COVID vaccine do reduce transmission. So that is possible. So here is how it is. So good that if they are putting the data together. So let's see how a vaccinated person may shed less. I hope that is your question, right? Study showing 50% vaccinated still spread virus. Is your question that they still spread virus or is your question that they spread less virus? So can you give me <laughs> a bit, a little more clarity and then I would explain what is the situation. Ankit, Ankit Gadia says, our IgG S1 RBD AB value is my 1.45, Y3.07, with CLI a method after nine months of natural infection, positive greater than one. Are these values protective? Should we go for vaccination? So going for vaccination is not a problem because there is no variant. If you felt that, hey, I had an older variant and the newer variant may escape, I want to have a vaccine. Although I believe the newer vaccines are not adjusted, the vaccines are not adjusted to the newer variants. So the vaccine is still primarily addressing older variant. Having said that, vaccine would trigger your immune system once more and it would remind it so let's say this is your immune system you had gotten the initial vaccination so it went up became active for some months and then it calmed down right and now it is at this basal level basal level it is just 
humming along is just saying, you know, whatever. If this virus comes in, I'll fight with it. That's all. But I'm sleeping in the meantime. So that is what you're seeing with the with your results. In theory, if you got infected, these things should wake up. They should open up their eyes and they should become very mad and they should start creating antibodies and protecting you. That is exactly the kind of trigger you will get from vaccine as well. So if you wanted to have a controlled behavior of the system to say, you know what, I just want to uptick my system for the time being, then you can get a vaccine. And vaccine, we did the study, review of the study, that after the infection or vaccine, getting one more dose would uptake the system, but getting another dose will not do much. So totally your choice to take one dose, two doses, but your immune system would be ready from what I'm seeing here. Louis says, if I understand well, messenger RNA vaccines use same way as COVID to replicate. So it seems possible that messenger and an vaccine should have side effects that COVID itself have, haven't, correct? Long term, for example. Um, so, so it seems possible that, impossible, that messenger vaccine could have side effects that COVID itself haven't. So you have two negatives here. So it seems impossible, could have side effects that COVID itself haven't. So first, the basis of the question is slightly um, it needs uh, some adjustment. So the, the question you're saying that messenger RNA vaccines use same way as COVID to replicate, that is totally not right. So COVID replication, if I went into that, I would take up my the rest of the time. So I'm not going to do too much. But when the SARS-CoV-2 virus arrives in our body, SARS-CoV-2, number one, needs to feed its messenger RNA into ribosome. And the ribosome will then make more messenger RNAs. Correct? That is one. Plus, sorry, not messenger RNA. It would make a polyprotein. From that polyprotein, a big chunk of protein, there will be two enzymes that will break off automatically. That is called autoproteolysis. And anybody who wants to, one thing that, I always think about this, that how do you know if I am telling the truth when there are so many folks who are world-renowned virologists and spewing so much mistakes? So the, this is why I now, nowadays I've started saying the terms so you can Google them and see how long back these terms were, were known and are in the text. So this is autoproteolysis meaning automatic breakage of a protein. So there are two enzymes from here that break off of this protein. One is the RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and the other one is 3-chymotrypsin-like protein, or it is also known as MPRO. You can Google MPRO or 3-TCLP or CTLP. These enzymes would then, in turn, break these guys and take smaller enzymes out. All of these enzymes will then run around in the body, in the cytoplasm. That is the body of the cell, right? In the cytoplasm, and they will manufacture more phospholipids. They'll ma manufacture more M proteins. They'll manufacture more N proteins. They'll manufacture more RNA pieces. They will manufacture smaller pieces of RNA to make more enzymes. It is a very complex process of replication. Then all of those things are assembled inside Golgi operators into a new virus. Then the virus pinches off and takes a part of the, the vesicle membrane with it, then it gets out of the cell. Poor vaccine has nothing like that. What vaccine does is here is the cell. N lipid nanoparticle came in. It released the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA went to the ribosome. Ribosome created spike protein from it. That's it. That is where the total similarity finishes. There are no enzymes in there. There is nothing. Now this gets fed. This spike protein gets fed into an endosome, which is going to shred it and load it on MIC1 and 2, 1 and or 2, and then present it on the surface. So no similarity at all, other than the initial one step of using ribosome to make uh, more of the viral proteins. Here we are making spike protein. Here we are making a complex factory. So very different. 
So uh, I'll tell you from a mechanism point of view, we'll see in the long run what are the side effects. But from a mechanism point of view, I do not see any side effects of messenger RNA vaccines, which are going to be any different from, let's say, the original infection or from other vaccines. Nergi says, these news are circulating on social media. My family members are forwarding to me as I am a medical student. They're all vaccinated. Yeah, so no. <laughs> Uh, of course, then we <laughs> we are all who are vaccinated are then listening to such garbage, and we say, "All right, now that is a prediction for I to be di dying." And then there is this uh, theory or rumor, or I do not know what to call it, of depopulating the world. So then they say, "All right, everybody who has gotten the vaccine are going to become depopulated." So these are just garbage. So <clears throat> Tom Johnson says, Dr. Bean, Israel cases with over 90% vaccination is no different than Portugal cases with only 20% vaccination. So why do you keep showing Israel cases and saying you see the vaccine is working? Because it is working. So if you said, hey, in Portugal, something else is working, all I need to see is what is working there. So show that as well and say, hey, it is working, but just tell me what is working. That's all. I am not against or pro if a society locks down. For example, remember I talked about Korea. In the very beginning of the pandemic, they locked down, they wore masks and they controlled it. New Zealand controlled it. Taiwan controlled it. They didn't use vaccines at that time. So the thing is, it's at the end of the day, it is to control. If there is someone who can control a country, a community, who can control it well, then so be it. More power to them. Ashraf Vlogs says, can vaccine like AstraZeneca be the cause of increasing blood pressure after one week of vaccination? I am not sure. I haven't heard of this before. So this is an interesting question, Ashraf, but I have no idea. I have to do some research about this one. Can you tweet this at me? Uh, my Twitter is Dr. Bean underscore medical. If you tweet it, I can then take the question from there and then research it. At this time, the question would just scroll away and I won't be able to. So Alfred Chow says, why does the black fungus appear weeks after recovery from COVID? So actually it is not weeks after the recovery, but what happens is, during the COVID, we are giving broad spectrum antibiotics. And so it is possible that the as the immune system is suppressed, but still the person is somewhat protected. However, once the diabetes is out of control or steroid use is increased or at home usage of nasal cannula or oxygen or devices that may not be as clean, when that starts happening, that is where it starts becoming more and more prevalent. So instead of saying weeks after, we should say as soon as the body reaches a state of acidity that may be in the hospital or that may be at home, that acidity that is used by this uh, mucormycosis to grow faster, then it would start growing and it would start causing issues with the nose, jaw, lungs, brain, quite a damaging uh, outcome. Gurav says, whether uh, avermectin hampers the effectiveness of co-vaccine as it uses dead virus as a whole rather than RNA. So the it will not do it, and I'll just draw that quickly. So let's say <clears throat> here we have given a dead virus. So this is <laughs> this is my depiction of a dead virus, right? So the, this is the dead virus that has been given. Now. Of course, we don't expect from this dead virus to enter the cell through ACE2 because this is a, a virus that is um, inhibited from replication. So can it still enter it? Yes. Is that the primary thing we want it to do? No. Normally, by giving dead viruses or other vaccines, all we want is the immune system cells in the vicinity, which are macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, 
natural killer cells, but mostly macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils, they are going to eat these viruses up. They're going to eat them up. They would, they would phagocytose them or pinocytose them, but these are phagocytosed. So again, you can check this up, phagocytosis. They will eat them up, and then they would break them down, and then they would present it on the surface. So the dead viruses, let's say that ivermectin is present, and it binds with the spike proteins of this dead virus. Then what? It is still going to be picked up by macrophage, and macrophage is still going to destroy it and still going to present it. So not a big issue with the ivermectin. So with this, let's do this. There are so many questions here. Um, maybe we should do that 10 hours long discussion. There is a super chat. I'm going to quickly look at that. Alex, autoimmune diseases often take years to get established. So the messenger RNA DNA vaccines won't be known safe for years, by the way, Dr. Bean, you're great. So thank you very much for the uh, kind comments. The problem is that the messenger RNA vaccine for it to create an autoimmunity forever. There is something that has to bother the immune system forever. And again, I cannot guarantee it. It's a newer vaccine. I took this as well. Now, is there a chance for that vaccine? For example, I'm going to give you a wild concept here that may lead to a future autoimmune disease. But is it really possible? We do not know. So this is a, this is a, in, this is a, fascinating concept. I'm saying it's not truth or reality. So please don't con uh, consider this a fact. Imagine that the messenger RNA vaccine arrives in a cell. In the cell, it creates a spike protein. Now the spike protein is chopped up and then it is shown in the cell and the cell is then taking part in the innate immunity, uh, sorry, the adaptive immunity training. In that process, that messenger RNA, the spike protein that was produced, the cell in which that spike protein was produced, cell divides with the spike protein in it dividing, then divides for its own reasons. It's proliferating. And as it continues to divide, it is continuing to have the spike protein in it hanging around and duplicating with it. Now, this cell, if it continues to divide in our body for years, then it is going to have the spike protein hanging in it for years, bothering it, presenting on the surface, and causing some issue. Now, do we have any such cells in the deltoid muscle, for example, macrophages or neutrophils or, or uh, monos, what is that, natural killer cells? No, we don't. No dendritic cells? We don't. This would happen if you take the vaccine, for example, and inject it into a bone marrow and then allow the bone marrow to develop spike proteins. And before it is uh, that cell is destroyed, just keep making copies of it. So just like ADE, that in theory, if we have to create this in lab, we can create it. In humans or in animals, this would actually not be creatable. So in uh, theory, this is difficult to have it for a long time. OK, so I need a comment from all of you. Whoever listens to this part, do comment. And that comment is, do you want to have a 10, 20 hours long session where we answer questions, or is that going to be too much? If you want it, we are going to do it this week. Now, also, please remember, Wednesday, we have Dr. Bream with us. He is an ICU physician. And then on Friday, I believe we have Dr. Hector Carvalho from Argentina with us as well. So have your questions ready for him. I have tweeted, and I would collect questions from there. Thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share, and like at minimum. <laughs> And if you would like to support this work, there are links for PayPal or there is a link to buy me a coffee if you don't want to use a PayPal. And there is a link to become a patron as well. So with this, thank you very much. I'll see you this evening.